So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really thrilled to be co-presenting with Rika Shakya, who I met at the cyberspace conference, uh, Mapping Cyberspace, I think it was called, that Robbie Barnett put on at Columbia University a few years ago. And I have to say, I was the one who uh, supplicated him to uh, repeat the performance of Waterfall of Beer, which was so wonderful at the uh, Translation Poetry Slam last night. And um, just a really bright, up and coming scholar and um, somebody that I look forward to learning much from. Well, thank you, Holly Love, for such a kind uh, introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, do, we have pe do we have people locked out? Um, a pleasure to be here. It's been a, such a lovely learning experience and to have the opportunity to sit down and hear so many people talk about their translation processes has been just the most lovely experience, I think, especially a chance to get away from the humdrum of New York, New York life and <laughs> sit and have such slow and uh, fruitful conversations. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, and also, it's an opportunity for me to um, perhaps do a different sort of presentation than I would do in a history department. Uh, um, I'm at Columbia. I'm a third year PhD student studying with Gray Tuttle. And I uh, do uh, Sino Tibetan relations uh, during the Ganden Podong and the Qing period. And uh, if I were to speak very broadly about the kind of ideas that I'm grappling with in this presentation, uh, in the most broadest sense, I'm looking at the relationship between history and literature. And uh, particularly at the valency of uh, Indic literary aesthetic in the making of an inner Asian empire, and very specifically about how Tibetan lay elites articulated their relationship to the imperial center while at the same time maintaining uh, family, uh, communal, uh, religious, and regional ties. And just to introduce a little bit about my uh, research, I look at sort of the uh, history and uh, uh, the writing of the history of the uh, early Qing expansion into central Tibet. And the primary sources I work with are the biographies and autobiographies of uh, Tibetan lay elites, Tibetan Galans. Uh, many of uh, us, uh, I mean, uh, many, of, many of you among us will be familiar with these uh, works. Uh, you know, they're very famous Tibetan uh, uh, literary works and uh, key historical sources for the study of Sino-Tibetan relations. Uh, many will be familiar with the Miwan Dokje, uh, the biography of uh, Miwan Polone, written by Dokhatri Nwangke. Uh, and then uh, Dokhatri Nwangke's own autobiography, Kalun Dokje. Uh, and later, uh, Doring Pandita's Namta, uh, written by Doring Densi Pejo. And then um, I'm also uh, happy to have the chance to introduce a fourth uh, source, a fourth, uh, autobi a fourth biographical work about a Tibetan lay elite during this very tumultuous period of Zion Tibetan relations, that being the Surkhang Dokje, uh, biography of uh, Surkhang Sityo Seden. Many of you will know the Surkhang family, um, still uh, prominent today in uh, Tibetan society. Uh, so I'm going to present extracts and portions of uh, text from three of these sources. I've, ch I've chosen to omit Galen Dokje because we have examples of Dokar's writing when he's uh, writing about the life of, 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 of Miwang. Um, I think it's first important to uh, explain a little bit how I approach the works. So uh, just moving on to the... I'm interested in the act of inscribing empire. So many of you who might... Uh, be familiar with uh, Qing history, will know that during the Qing Empire there was a very concerted effort to construct uh, imperial landscape uh, through uh, you know, Buddhist notions of sovereignty and uh, governance. And uh, many of you might have recognized the first uh, sort of background image uh, of, of, of the first slide, of the title slide, uh, was at uh, Wutaishan. And I think uh, 
historians who work more with material culture and wor work more with art because I think just by the nature of their discipline, they are more attentive to uh, sort of issues of representation, issues of methodology uh, and the modes of representing. Uh, they've really been able to sort of touch at some of uh, the, uh, the inscriptional processes of the Qing Empire, uh, especially in uh, multiple uh, languages. And uh, in recent years, in the last 20 years, we have had uh, uh, sort of the development of what we call new, Qi, what has become known as new Qing history. Uh, so Qing historians who work in uh, languages that are not uh, Chinese, uh, prominently Manchu. Uh, so I'm sort of trying to engage with these works and build with these works and push us a little bit further uh, because I feel uh, currently, sort of conventional Qing history, although has you know, although it has moved away from looking at sort of sinocentric histori uh, looking at historiography and doing historiography through uh, moving us away from the sort of sinocentric uh, worldview, uh, it still takes into um, it. It understands uh, the way the Qing uh, ruled their empire uh, by looking at sort of constituent uh, populations in the way that. Um, in the way that we might imagine a sort of modern day a politician and uh, their constituency is today. And, uh, you know, I, I, take issue, I take issue with this because if we think about how the empire was made, it wasn't uh, necessarily with these uh, broad constituent populations, but instead uh, the relationship between imperial center and, uh, you know, Tibet, Mongolia, uh, and um, uh, Muslim populations were actually uh, largely governed by the relationship between the Qing court and specific groups of uh, elites. And that's why I'm talking about uh, these uh, Tibetan, Tibetan elites. And uh, I would argue that uh, just as there was a very literal inscription of empire taking place across, um, across such, uh, such a vast landscape, um, there was, a lit there was literal, just as there was a literal sort of inscription taking place, there was also a literary inscription. And uh, I look at uh, the way that these uh, Tibetan political uh, figures wrote uh, their life histories, life stories, uh, as a sort of uh, process of literary inscription, in that uh, while they narrate uh, the Qing expansion to central Tibet, they're also, they also narrating and inserting themselves into the expansion and talking about their roles here. So uh, all of the three excerpts will be about um, this sort of process of literary inscription. Uh, sorry, that, that maybe. Of, uh, th that, that, that's just sort of a, sort of a recapitulation of some of the uh, scholarship on the sort of uh, the role of the uh, sort of lay elite or the, the role of elites uh, in the articulation of relationship between um, empire and uh, sort of subject uh, populations. Uh, but I, you know, I, don't, I don't think we have to dwell on that particularly long. But you can see the kind of scholarship that I'm uh, building on, and of course, the title of my the subtitle of my presentation is called Language of Loyalty. So. Uh, there are, some of you might know there are two quite prominent papers called Language of Loyalty. Uh, there's uh, Christopher Atwood looking at the Mongolian context and David Brophy looking at the sort of Islamic context. And they are interested in how a sort of uh, bureaucratic uh, form of uh, Manchu uh, influenced uh, Mongolian literature during the Qing and how it in influenced sort of uh, Islamic and Sufi literature during the Qing. And I'm uh, sort of aware of the of the um, development of, of the kind of crystallization of a very particular kind of bureaucratic and legal form uh, in Tibet at this time, but I'm more interested in the persistence or the potency of uh, poetry. And uh, I think before we get into the uh, excerpts themselves, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I approach these texts and my experiences of working with these texts. So the Tibetans among us will know the Muang Dokju is considered by many Tibetan literary scholars as a, as a pinnacle of, 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 of high literature. So when I was first exposed to the Muang Dokju, I was uh, studying Tibetan literature. I was studying a Nyangak, and my teacher said, if you want to improve your Tibetan, if you want to learn what a good Nyangak is, 
you'll read the verse of Dokhawat Srinwangya. And in fact, you have the Tibetan language scholarship on these texts uh, talking about them in the literary sense, to the extent that you had a scholar in Amdo say that uh, Dokhawa Srinwangya was uh, the Tibetan uh, equivalent of the great uh, Qing literati Cao Shui Chun, who you might know uh, wrote the Hong, Hong Lo Meng, Dream of the, Dream of the Red, Red Chamber. Uh, so they're interested in these works as, uh, as, as literary works. Um, whereas Western scholarship on these uh, biographies has been largely taking them as uh, sources to mine for historical data. So you might know uh, Luciano Petek, the eminent scholar of Tibetan relations during the Qing. Uh, you also might know uh, Zahiruddin Ahmed, who also wrote about this, uh, wrote about this period. Um, and we can see in the above uh, quotation from uh, Petek's uh, sort of exemplary work, uh, the way he treats the form and the style of the Miwan Dokje. Uh, and I think that's representative of, uh, of the way in which a lot of us historians use these sources, is that we find uh, the caveat, we find the verse, we find this difficult language an obstacle to the task of historical recovery. <laughs> To the point, you know, I've, I've had, I've, been, I've worked with friends, and I've done it myself, where uh, you're reading a passage from the Miwan Dokje or Golan Dokje or Doran Pandita's Namta, and you sort of take it for granted that uh, you say, okay, I, I've, I've, I've read, I've read the, this passage above, and the Nyangak that follows it, oh, it's just a recapitulation, it's just a summary. We'll just gloss over that. It's too difficult. I can't get past all of these synonyms. I can't get past all of this Ngunja. It's just the same thing. Well, who cares? And uh, I mean, uh, when, when I first started doing these works, I, I was just doing a very literal, literal translation, and I thought, oh, th 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 that's fine, why not? And, um, and then I started to uh, realize that, you know, in, Chinese hist in, in Tibetan and Chinese history, we don't take literature very seriously. And uh, then I started reading about, uh, uh, you know, I started reading works from South Asia. I started reading works on the Mughal Empire, and there they take literature very seriously. So that leads us to the the next um, sorry, no, sorry the, 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 the sorry the, 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 the bottom the bottom quote uh, the sort of uh, Sheldon Pollock I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, I'm no Sanskrit scholar but I am very much inspired by his work he's at Columbia of course I haven't taken a class with him but I've uh, had a chance to read many of his books and articles and uh, I was struck by his notion of epic space the production of epic space. And I think this is uh, particularly, uh, you know, um, particularly relevant uh, to these uh, great works of Tibetan literature that have also formed the basis for our understanding of the history of Southern Tibetan relations, Southern Tibetan relations during the Qing Empire. To the point where, you know, these works have existed in, uh, these works have existed in a Chinese translation uh, since the 80s. So in the 80s, there was a great move because, of course, the, uh, the, you know, the PRC loves to claim uh, you know, uh, Qing history as Chinese history and build uh, contemporary political claims on the basis of a certain interpretation of the past. So you can s already see these texts have become weaponized, if you will, by uh, <laughs> Chinese historians. But they also are not very attentive to the epic space of these works. Um, and epic space, um, I think, as you can, he says, epic space is a field that imposes a certain kind of political imagination upon territorial imagination. And we're going to see, you know, just as this kind of uh, political imagination became the very Bharat that we, you know, uh, to be think of as India, a version of India, uh, the epic space, of empire in the works of these Gullans became the crux of how we understand the history of Zion Tibetan relations of Tibet during the Qing, of the relationship between the Gandan Podang and the Qing court. Sorry. So before we go into the, into the, the excerpts themselves, I, I thought uh, for the benefit of those who, who might not be familiar with some of the characters that I've just introduced very briefly, some of the 
so, some of the characters who are going to feature. Um, of course, I have on the on the far right, I have uh, an image of the Chenlong Emperor uh, in a certain rendition of him by Giuseppe Castiglione as 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 as, as the Manju as Manjushri. And then next to him, I have the seventh Dalai Lama and uh, the king, the king being Miwang Polone himself, the lord of men himself. Uh, the image comes from a Dugbukadu uh, Tanka that Amy Heller has written a lot about. Uh, next to him, we have uh, the poet himself, that I, know I might call him a historian as well, the poet historian, Dokawa Tsringwangke, who really, uh, you know, it was his, uh, and his, it was his act of writing Miwang's biography that heralded this sort of a shift where you start having uh, lay political figures who have uh, biographies and who engage in life writing. Uh, next to him, we, uh, you know, I couldn't, we don't have a, we don't have an image, I couldn't find an image of Doring Denzin Bejo, but I have the Doring Zasa from uh, the early 20th century to stand in for his very eminent uh, um, you know, predecessor. And next to him, I have the same, uh, same uh, sort of, I've, I've done the same thing. This is uh, uh, the famous poet, Sulkan Wang uh, but he's standing in for his ancestor, Sulkan Sichu Tseten. And uh, you might be wondering why I've called Doring the captive. Uh, many of you, you will know that Doring was uh, at the head of the Tibetan forces during the Gorkha War and things didn't go very well for the Tibetans uh, during the first half of the Gorkha War, and he was captured, and he produced probably the f one of the only, I think, I, I hesitate to say the first, but the, uh, one of the only narratives of, ca uh, of captivity that we have in, uh, in, in Tibetan literature. So we'll move on. Um, the first, sorry, it's, it's, it's very, it's very text heavy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the first passage comes uh, from the Miwang Dokju, and this uh, this this, uh, this breakout session is called uh, you know, homage homage to the guru, dev dev devotion to the guru, loyalty to the nation, and of course, uh, Doka was a great practitioner, uh, and uh, he did have uh, relationships with many gurus, but if I were to think you know if I were to uh, you know, uh, identify who his Dalai Lama was, I would say it was Miwang Polone. He was Polone's right-hand man, and in many ways, he owed his life to Polone, because Dokka Tsringwange began the sort of Tibetan civil war of 1727-28 as a Rubin in the army of U. And of course, Polone, uh, with the help of Qing forces, defeated uh, the three uh, ministers Ngalum Jarsum, uh, and while Polone uh, and the Qing authorities executed these three ministers by an excruciating uh, process, the death death by a thousand cuts, um, death, by death by a thousand cuts, Lingche, you might be death by slow slicing. <laughs> he spared the life of his uh, close uh, associate and childhood friend, Dokar uh, Wadzreng Wangke. And then uh, 10 years later, he tasked him with writing a uh, biography of his life. Mm -hmm. So I won't dwell too long on the text, but uh, I will sort of point out, I've underlined uh, a particular part of the, of the passage where uh, Dokawa is describing the physical appearance of Miwang, and I thought this was just, uh, you know, it was an act of, 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 of devotion, uh, where the house and seer, who knows, but uh, he described the mandala of his smiling face like a full moon, like a spotted Uthapala flower. His face was ornamented with an oily mole. <laughs> and that doesn't sound very attractive to us, but when I sort of, I would like to preface uh, this passage by saying this passage actually is the explanation of a lung, lung by Terda Lingba, where Terda Lingba, uh, he sort of writes a lung that heralds the coming of a uh, mole-marked king, Gewo Dong Meqing. So the mole, of, the mole, of course, I mean, I think uh, 
Pandem, I was talking to Pandenja about this, and you know, different in different parts of Tibet, having a mole in a different part of your face is considered the most beautiful thing, the most regal, splendid thing. <laughs> so it continues and says, the lower part of his countenance was radiant, as if having been kissed by the sun, and adorned with a beard as black as a bee. And there's a lot of uh, animal imagery, a lot of bee uh, insect imagery, especially bees. So the bee, uh, sometimes you have it coming as uh, the bee who has a very beautiful eyes. Now sometimes you have the bee, the, the bees, the, 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 the color, the black of a bee is the purest black. Uh, and you sort of, uh, I've, no, uh, on the um, on the previous slide where I introduced the characters, uh, you can see uh, the artistic renditions of Miwang with his mole and his long his long beard and moustache. So, again, to talk about the processes of inscription going on here, uh, Delta Lingba's Lung actually heralds the coming of Miwang uh, after he talks about how the Shunja Emperor would unite uh, uh, the uh, unite politics and uh, religion. So you can see Polonaise being inserted into this greater narrative of, uh, of, 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 e of empire. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Um, and this, uh, this passage comes from the Surkang Dokju. And the Surkang Dokju, the Surkang was actually, uh, of, of the four characters, he, he, he was the latest. So uh, I haven't been able to uh, to date the text uh, exactly, but it 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 uh, it follows the it follows during Pandita's Namta. I estimate it to be written in 1820, and Surkang uh, was uh, active uh, from the sort of late 18th century until the mid uh, 19th century. Uh, and again, you have uh, the text begins with a sort of again long form narrative of the Qing expansion into uh, central Tibet. And uh, Surkang, writing about his family ancestry, again inserts himself into this narrative uh, by talking a little about talking a little bit about his uh, descendants and their activities in uh, in the expansion of the Qing into Central Tibet. And uh, I haven't uh, put it on the on the slide here because I think it's, uh, it might cause a little bit of controversy. But he claims that his uh, that, that his uh, Grandfather was actually a Manchu general, and I'm not sure if the Sukong family are, <laughs> are aware of their <laughs> so <laughs> of their Manchu heritage. Uh, so when you see the general uh, Epu Bali, uh, that is who Sukong Situ uh, is claiming as his uh, as his grandfather. But uh, you know, sort of ancestry aside, I would like to talk about the kind of language uh, that Sukong Situ Tseden uses uh, to describe uh, the kind of conflict, the, the expulsion of the Junga hordes in central Tibet by the armies of the Qing uh, emperor. So there's a lot of usage of uh, Ngunjo here. So I, I've decided, I, I, I sort of, sort of kept, I kept, I kept them, I kept them in rather than sort of, um, you know, the blistering golden, golden one being, being the sun, and the one born before the Garuda, you know, in Tibetan, uh, uh, referring to, uh, the, you know, referring to Aruna, the, 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 the charity of Surya, the sun god, um, and the image evoked is then of a charioteer uh, drawing forth a fiery, uh, fiery sun. And the Jungas, not in this passage, but uh, in passages uh, preceding, are characterized as rakshasas. So in Tibetan, simbo or norjin. Uh, so you can see what kind of narrative, uh, almost uh, civilizational narrative, is being uh, constructed here. And of course, uh, as the uh, as the emperor's uh, sort of celestial troops uh, expel the jungas, the jungas, these fearsome, fearsome uh, beasts, uh, fearsome monsters, are reduced to uh, pigeons, returning to their nests. And to follow the theme of battle, I'll move on to the next slide. The sounds of battle. 
and this is taken uh, from a very, very interesting uh, verse uh, that comes at the end of Doreen Pandita's, uh, Doreen Pandita's uh, sort of a chapter or s section of his biography uh, about the Gorkha War, about the conflict between the Tibetans and, uh, and, the, and the Gorkha king. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, Doreen uh, led, the, led the Tibetan troops to a rather uh, ignominious defeat and uh, was captured. So he describes his involvement in this conflict in a chapter, and then he writes a poem. And it's not uh, any old poem, because uh, in terms of form, it is a uh, acrostic poem. I, it's uh, what we call a gabshe. It goes gakakanga uh, and repeats itself over and over again. It's very, very, very lengthy, very beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, uh, for this slide, I haven't I haven't maintained uh, maintained the form, but I've gone more uh, more for the content. But we did have a quite a quite a lively conversation yesterday with uh, Dominique, who has a great experience rendering uh, rendering these types of poems <laughs> into very beautiful form. Um, but here, I would like to sort of uh, draw attention to some of the sound uh, sound imagery and the, um, for example. Uh, the sort of the, con the contrast between uh, the sounds of anguish, the sounds of cowardice, and the sounds of defeat of the Gorka minister of the Gorka king and the Gorka ministers, and the triumphant cries and the victorious cries of the of the Qing of the Qing troops. So we can see that these texts. Uh, they narrate a very compelling saga about uh, ethical values and kingly conduct, about duty, power, loyalty. It's really a story of sort of universal resonance. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to consider the precise uh, political claims that these figures are making, but it's only through examining these specific exchanges in their literary contexts that we can really uh, understand the intersection between uh, power and empire. And um, to show the kind of uh, the valency of caviar, uh, I'd like to just to go back to the second to the second to the second slide and say that you know. Uh, What's behind, uh, you know, the background image? This is uh, a poetry uh, uh, stele at, uh, at 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 Wu Taishan, and it is, uh, you know, attributed to the Qianlong Emperor. So a few year, two years ago, I was looking at uh, sort of the poetry of the Qianlong Emperor, and he has, of course, thousands and thousands of poetry uh, of, 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 po of poems in, in Chinese. He has po he has poems in the Manchu, and of course, they are also Tibetan. Uh, Tibetan po poems attributed to him, you know, whether or not he wrote them himself, who knows. But uh, the Tibetan uh, texts of some of these dilis are very much, uh, they, they very much play with the Kavik conventions uh, and they play with Tibetan figures of speech. So you can see that there was a real attentiveness to aesthetic in the making of, uh, making of the empire. And uh, it was really, uh, caviar, it was really verse that offered a potent way to imagine a power and uh, conceptualize uh, one's sort of own role in this larger imperial process. I think I'll leave it. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we have two rather radically different time frames, but I think the unifying piece here is the role of um, verse or song um, and expressions of loyalty. So I, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I do. It's okay. I'm trying to switch PowerPoints here. Yeah. Oh. So, um, it's going. 
So we're going to come right into the almost present, so the um, mid-2000s, and, um, and sort of pick up some of the, you know, what is the work that verse, Kavya, Kennings, metaphor, so, um, but we'll leave, we'll leave behind the specificity of the Kennings, and I love that you actually left them intact in your translations. I think this is always a question for us. You know, do we say seven horses, or do we say the sun, you know, and, and how do we signal if we do maintain the Kenning, how do we signal actually what, what it is, and, and you did that really beautifully and poetically. Um, so, pop songs, we don't have so much caveat, but actually I got into looking at pop songs um, partially because I was a grad student on a Fulbright in Shining and got extremely bored there while I was just practicing and learning enough uh, Chinese and, and Golok -ke to, to go into Golok and do research. But also um, I started to, as I was watching stuff, and, and, you know, luckily, because of karaoke, thank goodness, you know, they put the Tibetan below. So, you know, I was sort of not a sing-along, but a read-along. And um, I started to get really surprised at how good the poetry was, you know? And I thought, what is going on here? Like, who's writing this? And then I started to notice, and I paid attention to the names, and a lot of them seemed like monastic names. And I was collecting VCDs, you know, in Shining, but also as I went to different parts of Golok and Lhasa and different places, collecting these VCDs and, and realizing like this one, you know, that they're not only, you know, they're not only are religious figures possibly writing them, but they're dedicated to religious figures. And then I figured out actually monasteries were producing the VCDs and um, not all of them, but, you know, there's a huge market of monastery produced VCDs, particularly at that time, in which devotion to the Lama and loyalty to the nation are somewhat deliberately conflated. So that you have Tibetan Lamas standing in as central figures that are honored not only for the sake of the Buddhist teachings and religious sentiment, but also for the, the sense of a unifying charismatic force for Tibetan culture. So, um, so here's a, another example. This one is a, a, a monastery produced VCD for Adzum Gyalse, Pema Wangyal. And, um, and basically you can just see in the cover there and in the cover of so many of these. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Where is it? Is it this one? This one? Oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I know that. I'm just like <laughs> up here on stage and so I can't remember anything. Mm. Is it there? Oh, but it's not here anymore. Okay, oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> so you can see the kind of configuration already of the sort of standing of the Lama at the top and then this cluster of, of singers down below. And it turns out that monasteries were commissioning some of the top pop stars to sing songs that are eulogies to the Lama, devotional songs. But actually these same pop singers on their own albums also had devotional songs. So it's not just that they were sort of paid for hire, but that there was some investment in this kind of devotional impulse. Um, so I call these eulogies to the Lama, and I have an article on this in an edited volume on religion and modernity in the Malia that came out two years ago. But um, so this is my own term, but it's, it's really to express these devotional tributes to Buddhist teachings, um, the centrality of the Lama, both visually in the footage, on the cover, and as the object of devotion. and um, and that it's religious figures themselves. It's, it's monks, clerics, scholars, and even some of the songs are gur of the Lama that are put on the VCD dedicated generally to him. Um, I don't know that I collected a one. Well, I, uh, there are some um, for Kondra Tari Lama and Namta Rinpoche, so for that couple. Um, and these are consonant with folk genres. So songs of praise, chula, songs of remembrance, jenla, songs of sorrow, chula. Um, supplications, laments, we find these different kinds of genres. And the footage that accompanies it is actually signaling kind of our positionality. So the singer actually, um, it, it sort of gets overlaid. Some of these are kind of low budget. 
So the, I only found a couple that actually the singer was on site at a festival and that was the film. Usually they were depicted, you know, um, they're, they're in a studio and then images from the monastery are behind. And often these images of the monastery are either, you know, uh, shrines like this, but often it's actually the, the um, teacher sort of at the charisma as a charismatic centerpiece for a ritual occasion. So we, we are positioned as watchers of the video as sort of um, virtual participants in ritual occasions eliciting devotion and then the singers are modeling that devotion. So with gestures of reverence and then of course the, the um, lyrics are also either reverential, devotional or a lot of ethical advice, this is the other reason I got interested, a lot of ethical advice is mixed in. So a kind of, this is one way that the sort of t uh, t works of advice to the lady get disseminated is in condensed forms in these songs. So this is Darzo being, you know, telling the broader Tibetan public, rely with trust on the undeceiving three jewels. The actual song is Langdor Drenkul and em emphasizing the importance of religious observances. So. You just see it echoed in the lyrics, the um, visuals, and the, especially the postures. We were talking about um, embodied acts of devotion going along with the literary or going along with song, and this is really poignant um, here. And so this is really, to, these songs stimulate and sustain an affect and orientation of faith that places the Lama at the center and pinnacle of Tibetan social world. So a, way, a sort of, um, figure to cluster around, if you will, a figure to uphold. Um, so devotion to the Lama is, no, is not just that, it is that, but it also signifies loyalty to Buddhist values and Tibetan leaders. So that's my contention, and I want to show you a few examples. So this is from the, the, um, the VCD dedicated to, um, um, to Adzam Jelse and but I have also, I've created a little montage with uh, Ngai Lama from uh, Kunga. So this is, we have to remember back to the mid-2000s. These are the pop, pop stars of that time, you know, Kunga and Yadung and, and uh, Junpei. And so I'll show you this excerpt. I think I'm going to try to click out of this um, to do so. And then I want you to watch for some of these themes. And I just want to hear what you also see. Um, Let's see if this will work. You could go ahead and do that while I'm looking for this because, uh, okay. Whoops. <laughs> this is me, Dakpa. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is a little montage of pop music. Let's see if it'll, oh no, that's not what I wanted. Oops. Let me try this one. Uh, what I want is the, MP, the MP4. Here we go. That? Where's the sound? Uh, hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, this is Kunga. Ah! 
because of the portions we saw. Um, I'm just curious what you all noticed in that. Mm -hmm. Did you have something, Heidi? No, that's all right. I'll deal with weirdness as you. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe not necessarily just this on the screen, but I think it's a. Wait, can we get out of this? Do I have to repeat what I just said? <laughs> I was just saying that um, this might be a continuation from what was actually just shown on the screen, but that there is even this ability that there that the monasteries feel that there's a need for this popular music from the monasteries of guru devotion that it actually comes through because i think within our culture if we would see a christian group put out vcds we'd be you know such as we would think it's such a marginalized uh sect of our population but i think we are seeing within even in these videos, that it just permeates this devotion, whether it's guru devotion or devotion in general, just permeates their culture. And so it's just really interesting to see how there's a need for these VCDs and that people are buying them to the point where pop singers are investing their time and energy to doing so. And then I think it talks back to what you were asking about the sincerity within these epics of, uh, you know, was it sincere or not from the author? But then it's like, what is this... Um, device of literature and of you know of pop music using devotion and what is it doing for the audience so i just think that's really interesting is that you know whether it's politicized or not yes no maybe who knows but i just think there's a a larger mm, something going on significance of these mm -hmm. materials of the 13th Dalai Lama in this year. Maybe it's a subtle resistance. Yeah. After the Buddha Razor. Yeah. <laughs> so that may be like really, maybe we should. Um. <laughs> I switched to the mind. Oh, you did? <laughs> um, that might be a really obvious, obviously, way that, that um, the state and the Lama get conflated, right? But. Um, Certainly, that's that's one piece of evidence, right, for these eulogies being an expression of loyalty to the nation. What else did people notice? Yeah. Seeing up in the sky, you know, it's like yeah. individual. You know, remember if you didn't have to call them on the CD does it for you. Great. <laughs> the visual, visionary apparition of the Lama. What else? There seemed to be some Han Chinese at the end there doing some rather quickly frustration. Okay, so that's that's important, a, a, a place of inter-ethnic yeah. unity around Buddhism, which is actually quite long-standing if we think about the Qing and the, and the Republican era. Yeah, the 13th Dalai Yeah, yeah. And of course, you can't put the 14th. Yeah. So that's a stand-in as much of a, as a gesture to, to the historical rootedness of, of, of the loyalty to the nation. Anything else? So, yeah. I just think it's wonderful that we did this. We have, I've been um, due to karmic, uh, karmic bondage, <laughs> making yearly trips yeah. to Eastern Tibet and watching these yeah. things. Yeah. It's part of life and seeing even the uh, young people going to bars at night and having these long sleeves <laughs> to them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, strident songs <laughs> coming out, which yeah. I can't, they don't go in there because there's so much cigarettes now. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's really fascinating that you right. brought, that you noticed this. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's more. So, so. Nobody mentioned yet the sort of gesture of Kunga and Yadang. Yadang, amazingly, is it's very rare to see Yadang in like a nomad outfit, right? And I think it was part of the clip where he's like this. At the end of the video, he does a full prostration from afar. He's likely on a hill outside Chengdu, right? But because the, the singers, they're often filmed, you know, outside in Chengdu and then transposed onto the scenes of the monastery of Tibetan landscape. He does a full translation. This is like a, a not full, full prostration. Um, 
and the, uh, we could, we could, yes, we could do that. Uh, translation as a full prostration. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that evokes the sort of Lama Jangpe kind of genre. He's from afar prostrating to the Lama. Um, uh, Kunga is actually films on site at Serta quite a bit, and so he's prostrating to Kempo Jigmi Punsok at Serta, but um, the great Kempo had already passed. So, so both of these are, are filled with longing, and I think that longing f for afar is, um, for the Lama from afar, has of course implications for. Tibetan lamas in exile. But notice here, this is where I was starting to pick up on, oh, these are the, these are the, these are the religious figures who are writing these pieces. And, um, and then, you know, the singer. Um, and it's such beautiful poetry. I mean, especially in this one, turning one's full attention. Even as a shawl of white clouds adorn the neck of the regal mountain, the field of my youthful vision is turned in the direction of the Lama. Even more wondrous than the love of life-giving parents or the moon dispelling the dark of night is you who are the torch for the mind dispelling uh, the murkiness of delusion. So the salvific powers of the... Lama and the edifying powers, and, and the, that video goes on to actually show text and, and talk about the Lama as, as the um, curator of, of the civilizational inheritance of Tibetans, and the monastics are then, as they're chanting, depicted also as the holders of that. So I think that's an important way that, that um, I think um, Tibetan lamas and kempos are positioning themselves, that it's not just that they're teachers of Buddhism, but they're holders of Tibetans, Tibet civilizational inheritance, the, the rikshung. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, kempo is speaking like a district lama or, mm -hmm. or particularly which are, are targeted as specific guardians. Talking in general, especially you could see that last one by um, Drunpei, where she sort of, um, you know, she follows the example of the lineage of nobles and sublime ones, and um, and you know, thinking of what lineage is, and it's showing all these young tokus. So some of these VCDs highlight the one main lama of their monastery. Others include praises to other lamas. Some include, some don't have a main lama, so they ref, refer to those in exile or to the mu multiplicity of teachers in their place. So I think it's both specific and also a, a general impulse. I mean, I gather dozens and dozens of these. I have this, you know, big box in my basement, you know. Yeah. Is there one particular that kind of, it seemed like there was a lot of Kempo Jime Punso. I'll tell you, this period it was Kempo Jime right. This was just after in 2004. Um, I think after 2007, when they were hoping for reincarnation, I don't know if anything's been announced, it sort of started to taper off. But yes, in this period, he was, he was a really big figure. I also happen to work on Lauren Buddhist Academy, so it might be by, the selections might be biased by my own interest. But just to say that the Lama stands for so much here, right? Object of veneration for Tibetans and Han Chinese, a moral exemplar. You saw the liberating of lives. That's a, a really classic, besides doing a public empowerment you know, they're liberating lives on film as exemplars, holders of Tibetan civilization and inheritance, luminaries who dispel the darkness of ignorance, wish-fulfilling jewel, bearer of good fortune, transmitter of Buddhist wisdom, compassionate guide to benefit beings, and a leader who can show the way, the path forward for Tibetans. So um, I wanted to actually g key in on that term, um, Dunlam, in a moment. Um, and I'll just show you one more example here. And I, you probably can't read the, the, the sort of selections, but here's one where you see the patron. This was privately sponsored, not a monastery produced one. You know, you've got the patron down there and you've got the monks who wrote the lyrics and then of course the object of veneration, Kempo Jigpun. And then you have Dube and uh, the Cuckoo of Tibet and uh, Namka there as the main singers. But you have all kinds of things. So there's, there's um, praises to Tibetan learning. There's uh, Payul Drenga kind of songs. There's a, you know, Mayul uh, Dupa praise. Um, there's, and then there's also a song that Kempo Jigpun wrote to Dujum Lingpa, who's featured on the back cover. So it's just, there's a lot of different kinds of, and often advice, um, different kinds of songs in here. But this term, Dunlam, is really interesting, and I like to just translate it very straight, path forward. 
Um, sometimes it's Maongwe Dunlum, you pass forward into the future. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the, the Pukimirik is put before that. So it's a path forward for Tibetans into the future. And um, this is also, um, so this is a lot of advice literature, but also songs of advice have this um, language in it. Some are, songs are titled that. So here we have Rika, a different Rika. Um, really wonderful um, Gesar performer, along with uh, Dartso that we saw earlier, always using Tibetan gestures, dressing in Tibetan, only singing in Tibetan language. So that's also a kind of loyalty. And then, and then singing about loyalty to the snow mountains. We'll have an example of this by Kunga that is standing in for loyalty to Tibetan culture, to the nation. Um, and then these two terms, um, tundrel and tundril, are really actually quite interesting. And I have a slide on that for a moment, in a moment. But um, we can just see how unity is expressed, you know, the, the famous ngatso tsangma purik pundare, you know, this sort of, we're, we're sort of all relatives. Sometimes it's expressed um, as, you know, having a common ancestry going back to the imperial period. Um, sometimes it's expressed linguistically. I mean, these are things that Lama Jop talks about um, in his um, in, um, Inescapable Nation. And then, of course, the uh, Kasum, you know, the sort of territorial. And I think the territoriality in pop songs is often the snow mountains and the depiction of the snow mountains. Um, so here, this is a this is a VCD that um, Sherton did on actually the preservation of Tibetan language in 2001, and then all of the songs on that include images and vocabulary from the new dictionary of neologisms that Kempo Tsuchum Lojo and, and Ju Kalsung and others worked on. So he sort of there's also a pedagogical component in terms of um, uh, the preservation of Tibetan language. Um, but here are just examples of different um, pop songs that have become famous. This one, you know, from the Repkong Music Festival was really, really popular at its time, um, came out in 2007. Um, and then if you want to go on High Peaks Pure Earth, they have this one by Sherton where, you know, it starts out with little ch school children, different performers, all from different regions of Tibet, you know, speaking out um, sentiments of unity. So this is a broader theme beyond just the Lama, but I think these eulogies to the Lama also express that. So they share in this kind of promotion of Tibetan unity. Um, and very interestingly, Tundril and Tundril, just to think about how we translate some of these newer terms. So we've been talking mostly maybe about classical texts, but how we start to, to capture the nuance of what work Tibetan authors are doing either in song or in, in prose to be really attentive. So I was working on um, the Shipte Takma, which is an amulet for peace with um, Pema Tso from Sichuan Nationalities University, and I'll show you that at the end. And, and we noticed that there were two ways that, that unity was being expressed in, a in, a, in the speech that introduced that amulet. And she said, oh, they're synonyms. And then, and then it was like, well, why don't we just look? Let's just look at the Siksu Chenmo. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, Tundrel is harmonious relations between, uh, you know, groups. It's close and mutually beneficial. So you've got harmony between. And Tundrel is when you imagine, you know, a collective that is somehow united or cohesive. And then it's a kind of, you know, collective action, you could say. And so... In the text that we were looking at, there was a movement from tundrel to tundril. And in order to translate these, we also have to think about their resonances in Chinese. Right? We also have to think, where are they picking up on state discourse? So this is an image from a sign in, um, in uh, Dawu, the, the, um, the capital of uh, Golok Prefecture. And it's using this uh, tuanjie in uh, Chinese, which is tundril. So the Chinese are imagining Tibetans as part of uh, an already cohesive <laughs> collective. And, um, but in these, these songs and, um, and in the Amulet for Peace speech, it's, it's the Tibetans are that. So just thinking about our translation choices and, and how we capture the multivalence and the resonances and the implications, because we, we shouldn't be spelling them out so much if the, our Tibetan authors aren't, especially if they're, they're um, 
living authors. I even wonder about the tr translating Mirik as national or nationalities, whether it's national pride, um, because are we, ascri are we ascribing a political nature which is there, but it may not, it may be implicit and, and deliberately implicit, right? So that's just a, that's a very tricky thing when you're working with living authors who are, um, who are still in um, Tibetan areas of China. So um, just to hear Kempo Jikpun's voice, and um, during the promotion of Tibetan language 2010, 2011, when that was a real foment, there were images of lamas. So in the shops of Xining, you could find images of lamas with quotes about the importance of Tibetan language. And that was Gendon Chipel, that was the Panchen Lama, that was Kempo Jikpun. Um, and here's just something from his hard advice um, for Tibetans of the 21st century, where he's asking, you know, intellectual, young intellectuals and tulkus and, and elders, you know, all to come together, to work together in, with a kind of united approach to figure out a path forward for Tibetans, to articulate a Tibetan modernity. So that's, you know, the resonances of some of these terms um, you know, are quite widespread and just, and to look for those, even if we're just translating it in a pop song or a contemporary poem, that those, those, those words are being deployed in very specific ways and that Buddhist figures, while they're not necessarily the origin point, some of them are, some of them aren't, for a specific discourse. I think Kempo Jikpun was borrowing from Panchen Lama and also from having traveled abroad to Damsala and, and elsewhere. Um, but but to, 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 to have a sense of the resonances of those terms in discourse. And then this is Kempo Richtar. Um, um, this is the Amulet for Peace, which was um, introduced in 2012. And I worked on an article on this in Contemporary Buddhism with Pematso. But this idea of, of how Tibetans have to bond together and be united is very much... Um, um, at the center of Buddhist leaders' efforts, their ethical reform, their kind of advice to laity. And I really love how in the first quote, there's a sense of that a precious human rebirth is actually to benefit one's own people rather than to attain individual liberation. It's a new kind of collect collective liberation. And then here we have different vocabularies for allegiance, um, Shendong and um, Dungsem, and then um, some examples of, so the idea with the Amulet of Peace, and you see this young gentleman wearing it, was to stop Tibetans fighting amongst themselves. So a very kind of interesting, different form of nonviolence. Um, and I want to just end uh, this presentation and open it up to discussion with um, my favorite from Kunga. Now, I have to say it's pre-2006 because He's wearing fur, and that was not, that's, you don't find that anymore. But this is the path for, for Tibetan youth. It's on your, the other side of your handout. And it's just a really great tune, so I'll play it in full. And you'll see that he's, argue, he's articulating a path forward for Tibetans. He's at Serta Larangar. He's, um, he's, uh, and there's a, a line in which he goes to a cleric for advice, and you'll see um, he, this is, I think, one of the early instances of rap. Um, uh, not very sophisticated, actually. Rap and hip hop have gotten much more sophisticated in Tibetan pop, but this, I think this was an early version. And you'll see it's loyalty to the snow mountains, but it's really a discourse on Tibetan unity um, in, uh, that leads to a discourse on Tibetan unity. You have the translation. You need it, or just enjoy the Tibetan. Mm -hmm. hey. I have so many versions of the song, and I've listened to it so many times. <laughs> and uh, even I went back to the originals, and they all stop at that one. Whoops, that one funny point. Um, sorry about that. I forgot that that about that eccentricity. Um, grab the URL quickly. Um, 
By the way, if you don't know about um, High Peaks, High Earth, they're, they're, um, they're, they, since 2012, so they don't have this early stuff, but since 2012, they've been collecting um, pop songs and translating them, and it's just a, a great source for keeping up on what's happening. Um, of the sixth letter mantra. Mm -hmm. It was you know, it's a Tibetan text, and then the Mongolians made it into something singable, and they translated to Chinese. And I think it was 2015 when I was at Utaishan, it was everywhere, every single shop was playing it in both languages. And then you could hear it in taxis. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's definitely having an effect the other way as well, yes. in terms of you know, what this loyalty means now in terms of different nations. So it's heavy. It's that's it's a great really question. Simple. And that's, you know, that would be another whole conference, is the sort of effect of, of translation into Chinese, and that's at a, you know, what kinds Never of... Never meet the best, okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, you know, the, the, yeah, the politics of language there as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just wondering, what are the and, you know, this is a conference on literature, we may not be prepared to talk about music, but, you know, the, the kind of, the aesthetics of the music itself, um, and, you know, where this particular brand of popular music, you know, so you've got the Tibetan costumes, the Tibetan landscape, the Tibetan language, but the aesthetics of that music, that's really new and 
Chinesey, East Asian y, coming from like 1950s United States um, or Western kind of syrupy like <laughs> kinds of styles. And then on top of that, then you're getting rap, you know, which is like, whoa, we got China and then we got like, you know, American urban, ghetto, African American aesthetics all mixed in. And, how that's operating in its own register, which you know, it's just up to what people like, I guess, and and or what that signifies. Also, mm -hmm. the rap stuff. Right. You know, again, that's not Tibetans have not invented that. Like it's, you know, Korea is like huge, and China, and uh, obviously, but that's just a whole other register of style and aesthetics. Yeah, and a lot of these monastery BCDs actually have to. In the beginning, they had Dunlen. And then they moved into pop, but sometimes they have the um, midi in the background. But the but the singing style is what you would sing to Dunlin. Now Dunlin is also from the 1980s out of Ando Monastery. It was a monastery-based music that became highly popularized. But that's a sort of got an Andoa style. So I think there there is a big blend. But it's interesting the rap and then the eagle. So eagle and yeah. also. Uh, American flags and the <laughs> different things. Exactly. Yeah, the gesture, they're all signaling something. Can I, can I also make one more comment? Mm -hmm. it, it, just getting back to Rita's yeah. uh, presentation. You know, there too there was a really in interesting um, juxtaposition and sort of some tension between, we're talking about the Qing Dynasty and these aristocrats mm -hmm. placing them there, but the device that they're using is Indian yeah. kavya mm -hmm. aesthetics. And, and then at, in the last slide, you showed us that inscription, which I forget exactly what that was, but it was that was a Chinese thing, I think, that was supposed to illustrate that even in Chinese, they were they're all you're also using literary devices to you know create this national identity, you know. And one of the interesting questions, the larger questions, is to what degree. You know, so there's been some research on, you know, Kavya, Indian aesthetics doesn't really make it to China, and then what's happening is that totally at an unconscious level that Tibetans are not adopting Chinese uh, literary aesthetics, or whether, you know, maybe they are now, like in terms of Chinese poetry is really different than in Indian poetics, but at least the guys that you're talking about, to the degree it's Kavya, that's south, that's not, you know, east. No, I mean, I, I, I got almost no sense because I was, I was looking trying to find, uh, trying to look at sort of autobiography and uh, sort of Chinese, Chinese literati culture in, in the 18th century had actually moved away from a biography and autobiography. So I was I'm actually interested in the kind of, I was thinking perhaps early on that there might be some interplay between these uh, Tibetan lay elites, especially because during during Pandita spent time in Beijing, um, uh, I was trying to look at the interplay between maybe uh, Chinese literati and uh, and, and these governments, but there's almost there's almost almost nothing almost nothing. They're they're always looking southward, and I didn't touch on it uh, very much, but. Uh, their training, or you know, their training is uh, was all at Mindeling Monastery, and they studied the Rigne Chungunga, especially uh, Dundin, and um, all all four all four of them were incredibly well versed in 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 uh, in Yangach, and um, I mean, there are, it seems to be almost n nothing that they took from the from the, from the Chinese from the Chinese side of things. Relationship between monastics and the lay community that is unfolding in creative ways, mm -hmm. and so and and it's alive and well. Um, I think of a camp I've been studying with for years. His family's back there in um, Gonjo, and his sister has just stepped out on the scene as a pop singer, and he's the lyricist, mm -hmm. and so. Yeah, I mean, once you've kind of gone through a traditional Buddhist training, what are the options for your creativity in a pop culture in such a way? And then also creating this link between exile and family members back home. It's playing an important role there, so thank you. That's a cool example. Thank you very much for your talks, mm -hmm. both illuminating. Um, Riga, I thought you translated Chong as Garuda. I'm just wondering 
you know, I, I, I did the same thing in my inescapable nation, and I've been regretting ever since. <laughs> because I think I should have left it as it is, because it's very different from, because we have gotten kind of mythical tales, legends, because I have been studying sort of a bird, genre, you know, genre of bird stories, Fyadom Chidom. So in there, Chong features a lot, and uh, it's a very Tibetan kind of a bird, you know, mythical bird. Uh, a bit like Phoenix and Buddha, but I think it's quite right. So I, um, I, from now on, I'm, you know, I've been kind of, kind of translating it as John to, to, to kind of, I'm mean, living it as John. But, but what, what about what about specifically the term Chong Mungen? Because it has a current of Chong Munchi. Oh. Mm, still, Chong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I would uh, uh, translate the. Epithet, you know, maybe, but I don't know, unless it's, it's after it, of course, that's one thing. And all the years, you know, I am into pop music, that's why I kind of wrote an essay called, you know, Singing the Nation. Um, yes, um, this kind of popular devotion to Lama, it came out a lot, you know, there are a lot of CDs and DVDs came out, even still it comes out. And there's quite a, also quite a critical response to it by secular Tibetans. Mm -hmm. For instance, lots of people, Tibetans, have been saying actually one of the things that ruined Dabe, mm -hmm. uh, Dabe's kind of singing and Dabe's lyrics and everything, some people think it kind of declined, it never mm -hmm. improved. He was at his height maybe 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and the reason is that these Kambos uh, and Lamas start pouring in money uh, and start writing really kind of bad lyrics. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so you have a response. Actually, it was like one. Show me which the intellectuals yeah, yeah, got I, I, supplanted. Yeah. <laughs> I have one uh, as well here. Debbie uh, himself says yeah. actually, you know, I have Debbie was saying uh, quoted here. It says, "Ninjiktim deli nolwa shi zuiyo se tena lachtul tawa gyorje chanta ma general mongo chanta ki kalanya ni nisam chuchi kashob jisnos." You know, I, I made one mistake in my life. That is, I listened to a dude uh, by deceiving monks and lamas. Not, of course, all. He's not talking about lamas, but by some, you know, deceiving monks and lamas. Um, you know, wealthy monks and lamas, and who turned the direction of my art to a different. So there is that kind of a resistant, critical response by secular Tibetans towards that. Um, I, I might personally, I also find it a bit, bit too much, a bit kind of, <laughs> a bit tacky and a bit, yeah, 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 a bit too much. That's, very, that's personal reaction. You know. it's, it's very kitsch, yeah. and I think that that's true of, of Tibetan pop music altogether. I think some of the hip-hop stuff, some of the visuals are getting more sophisticated, some of the, the hip-hop lyrics are becoming more kind of inter uh, kind of international aesthetic. So, but I think pop music of this period in general had a kind of kitsch quality, right? And the, and especially the low budget productions. Now it's now it's becoming more sophisticated. But but yeah, the secular um, critics, especially with like the um, the Gepchu, you know, the new Gepchu, yeah, yeah. you know, incredible blogosphere controversy criticism of the lamas and taking us in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's there. But this this is really a, a, an important aspect of popular culture. I mean, this is you know on all the buses and in restaurants. And I mean, I think less so after two thousand and eight. But I mean, it still persists as an important theme. Yeah. I was just thinking about the <clears throat> the use of culture industry in general in terms of contestations over who uses it and for what purposes, and the kinds of aesthetics that it chooses to use. And in Tibet, the culture industry is obviously heavily controlled by the state. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting for you to make the comment on the fact that these monasteries are producing their own mm -hmm. uh, cultural industries uh, and then choosing to intentionally do it in a specific set of indigenous aesthetics. Um, and also in terms of like why they're choosing that specific aesthetic. And I'm, when I say aesthetic, I'm talking about text and music, mm -hmm. um, art in general. And what's also interesting is, um, so this also goes into because in terms of like the intentionality be behind using Kavya versus another tradition, right? So, um, but I was also thinking about the evolution of the culture industry in Tibet, and me and uh, some of them were recently talking about how um, the, the hugely popular music 
uh, competitions that happen in China, how they've started to bring in um, Tibetan contestants, mm -hmm. and including letting them win as, as a way to say, like, we have equal representations, mm -hmm. they have equal rights, you know, and, but also the fact that the, how the, each winner every year has aesthetically changed. It's gone from like very indigenous Tibetan songs that they, they won for, the aesthetic uh, that they won for, to now they're becoming more and more sinicized. So I think it's interesting in terms of the contestation of the culture industry being used by different powers. I have a question about uh, the relationship between the Tibetan states and Tibetan outside Tibet. And you have um, <coughs> the Dalai Lama will come out, we're talking about Chopa Sunan, and they need to go beyond that and to create the concept of one nation. And I'm wondering how these songs work, both um, do they receive these messages from the outside and then the songs kind of get created, or, or do they, are they played in India? I mean, I've seen some of them, like in Pajma Kativa, you know, on the streets mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, I think musically, the exile music is really different from the stuff on the... Um, I, I think there's a crossover of ideas, but I would hate to say they flow one way or the other. I think they flow both ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really, you're absolutely right. Now it is becoming the lyricists, actually, the interesting thing in the early 90s, 80s and 90s, like when Donnie come out, um, 80s and 90s were mostly intellectuals, teachers, university teachers, or intellectuals writing, most of them are the lyrists or folk traditional songs. Nowadays, lots of monks, lots of monks. Actually, some of the, uh, they're saying now that, um, for instance, show me the Tibetan literary website is saying their readership, most of the readership is coming from the monk, monasteries, mm -hmm. and the poems, and so, so there's a change happening, you know, there's great change happening. In terms of your question, there's huge um, kind of a exchange between the exile and Tibet, you know, Tibetans in Tibet. There's, I think there's been quite a, especially one of the kind of earliest songs, uh, like, you know, all that, kind of, yeah, similar to all those songs are coming from exile. They came from exile and it's one of the beginning of the kind of so-called contemporary Tibetan music. Influence came from outside Tibet. Tibetan exile singers singing about missing Tibet, and then that came back to to Tibet. That's that's one thing. But the other thing is, I think it's not just big lamas who has connection to Tibet. The, the big exiled lamas and monasteries who has connection with the with the Tibet. Obviously, that smaller monasteries, small you know, and less kind of well-known monks and people, individuals. The people who have been kind of being trained of accomplished geishis who hasn't gone, not famous, but they go back to their, back to Tibet, back to their monasteries, mm -hmm. and uh, brings a different ethics to it from exile, influenced by the Dalai Lama and people. Mm -hmm. so, you know, they are, they, the influences, I think, is like everywhere, must subtle. Yeah. I think another important trend to note is in the, so, so, so exile music, um, maybe being influential in the, in the beginning, less so, I think that at least the musicality feels really different. But but also the Tibetans on the plateau, many of them were singing either in Chinese primarily in the beginnings of their career, thinking of Yadong and Kunga and even Shertan. And then this huge push to, to, to shift into Tibetan um, and primarily Tibetan or even exclusively Tibetan. So you had before the Dunglin singers in Tibetan and then the you know, pop stars were singing in Chinese and then those sort of kind of started to cross over. And I think that's really important in terms of the language politics um, of the late 2000s. But even as early as 2006 with that Rep Kong festival, it was all, it was all, it was all in Tibetan. And so there's this, sometimes this exiled discourse that Tibetan music is getting lost in Tibet and that, you know, and that the, the exile, the folks in exile are the holders of cultural traditions, but actually it's really dynamic what's happening and, and that the sort of resurgence or the importance of Tibetan language and the kind of cult, that sort of um, f fervor of pres preserving it and, and, and even like old mothers starting to learn to read and write Tibetan and, you know, that, that, you know, that trend is also there and important.
Yeah, last question. Some people saying that the Lama is taking us in the wrong direction. What, 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 what are you talking about? What, 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 what did you say the Lama is taking us in the wrong direction? Well, meaning it's just, uh, you know, what this Tibetan critic, it's not what I said. Yeah. This Tibetan critic is saying that it's becoming done, it's like a kind of giving Tibetan popular culture and art a uh, kind of missionary, you know, missionary kind of a dimension to it. Or being taken over by Buddhism, it's not you know everything is everything about Tibet and Tibetan art and creativity is not Buddhism. So, so it's, a push against, against, it's a push against Buddhism. Not Buddhism. necessarily against, but saying, yeah, saying that yeah against the hegemony. Yeah. This might be Lama leading us astray. Yeah, and I think the blogosphere, you know, when that before before WeChat and other things sort of diffused that space. That was a that was a really potent kind of inter secular intellectual space. It's really interesting to think that Buddhist monks have infiltrated that. But you know, so yeah, we just see the sort of democratization of voices, which is so important. Do you want to yeah, I know we have to end, but I just wanted to say one thing that I thought tied yours together too was the um, well, at least in the last song you played this explicit focus on rethink, you know, on the, the name's yes. knowledge, right? Yeah. And for you too, it's like that that sort of, that recourse to that set of um, fields of study, which include Buddhism, but are not exclusively Buddhism, right? I, I thought that was just kind of interesting bridge between your talks. Thank you so much, I love you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.